Hello and welcome to Sonder. My name is Maggie and I am a knitter, spinner, sewist, bibliophile, new doctor, and future mom living here in Denver, Colorado. How is everyone? Um, pardon me if I sound a little out of breath. I am currently in my third trimester. Baby bump is growing, growing and growing. And it, this child is officially impinging upon my lungs. So I find that I get out of breath really quickly, but especially when I'm talking a lot. But uh, I've missed you all. It is February 10th here in Denver and it's very sunny and also very snowy. And it's just a beautiful day to come in and connect with friends. So thank you so much for being here. There are so many new people that I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, I was, I'm like one of those people who I started this because I just have had no nitty crafty friends really. And I wanted people to be able to connect with and talk to. And truthfully, I felt like the only person that would watch this would be my mom, which she does watch. Um, but I've been so overwhelmed by the beautiful connections that I've made with so many of you. So thank you for being here. Um, for those of you who are new, um, I am a physician. I'm in a residency program that's a dual residency. So I'm getting board certified in two different specialties. One of them is internal medicine and the other is pediatrics. And so every three months I switch back and forth between being an adult doctor and being a kid doctor. And right now I happen to be being a kid doctor. So um, I am in the emergency department right now and it's been interesting. Um, you know, the one thing that I will say that is nice is when I was first um, starting in the emergency department several weeks ago, it was like every single person that came in just had COVID and that was just the way it was where now it's not just COVID. I mean, there is some COVID, but there's also a lot of other things going on. And so it's just been nice to be like, huh, you know, maybe Omicron just like got everybody. And then if you were vaccinated, maybe it didn't get you. Or maybe it did, but it was mild. And now it's just, I don't know. I feel like we're at a lull, which feels good. I'm just gonna embrace this lull, enjoy it, and we'll just see what happens. So yeah, I'm in the emergency department right now. I've gotten to do a lot of fun things. It's interesting because, um, I was sewing up a lac, uh, laceration in um, a teenager's hand. Like she had just accidentally cut her hand open and it was like a pretty big cut. And it was so funny cause I was putting in some stitches and it made me think about this scene from Harry Potter right after um, Arthur Weasley is, uh, suddenly I'm like spoiler alert, but also these books are like 20 years old. So if you haven't read them yet, that's on you. Um, and also I do feel like I should mention that I do not support the author of these books because of how transphobic she is and I am just, I cannot. However, these books bring me and have brought me a like tremendous amount of comfort and joy over my entire life since they came out. Like these are the books that taught me how to love reading but also just within my med school and residency time, it's just, I am constantly on a re-listen of the Jim Dale recordings of Harry Potter. Anyway, I was stitching up this, uh, this teenager and I was thinking about that scene in, I think it's the fifth book of Harry Potter when Arthur Weasley is attacked and then he's in St. Mungo's 
and his wounds are not really healing very well because he's attacked by Nagini and um, there's, you know, venom and things like that. And they try some muggle remedies, one of which is stitches. And all of the witches and wizards are like, that's so barbaric, like stitches. They stitch up their skin. It's just so funny. I was like <laughs> putting in the stitches and I was like, yeah, that probably is kind of barbaric, but we do a lot of stitches in peds because kids just get into things, you know? So yeah, it's been really interesting. There's been a lot of trauma, you know, a lot of kids falling off handlebars and uh, falling out of their bunk beds and falling at school and a lot of uh, stomach flu. So if you're in the Denver area, <laughs> There is stomach flu galore out there right now. And um, then all the other viruses and things that kids get into. But yeah, it's been um, kind of nice. I think, you know, working in the emergency department is kind of stressful because then you have people who come in who are really not doing well. And as a med peds physician, so every once in a while we have um, adults that find their way into the um, children's emergency department. And the emergency room doctors that work there do know how to take care of emergencies, but they it is a bit out of their scope to take care of adults with emergencies because they are pediatricians. And so, um, it is kind of stressful when I am there because if any adults come in, um, in distress and I happen to be there, I do everything, uh, which is a little stressful just because I am someone who like, I think on the outside, it appears that I am doing very well and in control when stressful situations are happening. But on the inside, I am like internally freaking the fuck out. And so it's just been a little bit like every time I'm in there, I'm just like, please don't have any adults come in here because I don't want to be like the provider without having someone above me. Because I still have like two and a half years of training before I'm like allowed to practice on my own. So anyway, um... Yeah, what else has been going on? I, like I said, I'm officially in my third trimester. Baby is getting big. Baby is kicking and punching me a lot, um, which is fun. Yampa's coming in to say hi. Yampa, come here, bud. He doesn't want to come. <laughs> I can tell. He's like, I'm doing my own thing, um, which as an introvert, I get that. But anyhow, um, baby is kicking so, so much. It is now getting a little bit more challenging to sleep. And, you know, working in the emergency department, I do work nights like tonight. I'm going in at 10 p.m. and then I'll be there until 6 a.m. So, you know, no rest for the wicked. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a challenge, but I will say like nothing is worse than the first like 22 weeks of pregnancy for me, literally like 22 to 24 weeks. Like I've really only been feeling okay and good from a like nausea vomiting perspective for the last month or so. So that's a blessing. You know, for me, I will take the little like back aches and trouble sleeping over constantly vomiting anytime. So yeah, we're just getting excited for this little child to come, excited and scared. We've started kind of moving furniture downstairs and we're gonna be painting their bedroom. And yeah, it's happening. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, other things that have happened for me, you can kind of see here, but I got a spinning wheel, which has been so much fun. Um, so I will jump into the making because I have so much to talk about. And the other thing that I did want to mention is I do think that I'm going to change a little bit the way that I film these. So I think that every month or so, I will do like a general wrap up where I'll talk about the books that I've read and the things that I've finished and the things I'm knitting on. But I'll talk about them 
well, not the books I've read, because I think that's the only time that I'll really talk about the books, but all of the knitting projects, I think I'll talk about relatively quickly because I want to start making more like finished object videos for each knit. And the reason I want to do that is because I um, recently found the YouTube channel I think her, I think it's like Mel makes stuff or like Mel makes and Mel goes into such exquisite detail with each of her finished objects in her videos and I find them to be incredibly useful and easy to search for. So say you're knitting the bouquet sweater and you want to go into really like detailed information about like how that maker attacked that project in particular I just think it's so much easier to search like bouquet sweater you know <laughs> so um I have just found her videos she only has probably like five of the sort of finished object videos made but I have found them to be so so useful and I know that there are knitters on here um, from all different skill levels, you know, from people who are just dabbling into knitting and just learning about knitting. And they have a lot of questions that I think would be um, easily discussed in a more in-depth video than I feel like I can go into with these without them being like two and a half hour long feature length films. So that is the plan and the other thing that i think will be helpful with that is i'll just film them in small segments kind of as i'm making the project so um i don't think i'll do it for the bouquet sweater unless people really want like an in-depth you know video just about the bouquet sweater but i am planning on and have already started making little videos about all of the objects that i've kind of cast on since and including my yell cardigan. So with that, let's go. We have so much to talk about. I have some mending, I have some spinning, I have some knitting, and I think that's it. So um, yeah, let me just take a sip and we'll get going. It is crazy how much having like <laughs> this giant belly impedes on my life. <laughs> like I know that I complain a lot about being pregnant and I am excited to be a mother, but pregnancy has not like jived with my body in the way that I think it does for other women. And I'm just like, oh, but it feels so good to connect with you guys and be back here. It's wonderful to talk and yeah, I just, I can't say enough how much this community has meant to me. So anyway, with that, should we move on to some finished object talk? The uh, elephant in the room. So I finished my bouquet sweater, which is an amazing sweater by Junko Okamoto. And I knit this out of Brooklyn Tweed Shelter in two different colorways, the newsprint and hayloft colorway. So let me just kind of stand up and show it off for you. Huzzah! <laughs> so it's finished. I love it. I cast it off probably three weeks ago and I feel like I've worn it almost every single day since then. So yeah, it's getting a lot of love. Um, it is very oversized. I will say that this, even with my like pregnant belly, this probably has like 10 maybe 15 inches of positive ease on me, which is generally more than I usually want. And I think my, I think that my gauge was probably pretty off for this, but I love it. 
It is an all over color work sweater that is knit from the top down. It is, I believe only knit in, or there's only one size of this sweater. I knit mine in the worsted weight and it did come out quite large. Um, for reference, I am 5'10", so five feet and 10 inches, so I'm quite tall. Um, and I don't think I adjusted the length on this at all. So I am quite tall at 5'10". A lot of that is in my legs. So my torso is actually pretty short and would probably be equivalent to like a 5'6", 5'7", torso. I just know that because when I sit next to my mom, who's like 5'7", she and I are about at the same height. Um, and I weigh about 145 pounds, um, not pregnant. Right now I weigh 160 pounds, which I am so thankful to have finally started gaining weight. I've gained 15 pounds. I'm very proud of that because I lost a lot of weight in the first trimester. It was terrible. But um, my bust size right now with my larger breasts because of pregnancy, um, my bust size is about, I think, 38 inches right now. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, this sweater, I know that Kat, my dear friend Kat of the Heather and Hops podcast, she made this out of a DK weight. I made mine out of a worsted weight and hers is smaller to fit her smaller frame and is like breathtakingly gorgeous. Um, so I think that changing the weight of your yarn and knitting the same sweater would work really well. You just need to gauge swatch so that you can find out how big it will be because gauge swatching is important, though does lie, which I'll talk about later. But yeah, I really love this. The thing that's really amazing about the color work, I will come a bit closer, is that Junko Okamoto does this amazing technique where Sometimes you're catching the floats like normal and sometimes you're carrying the floats on the front of the work. And I was a little bit worried about this, I will say, before I blocked this sweater because some of the floats are quite long on the front of the sweater. So some of the floats are like seven or eight inches across. And I was very nervous that those floats were gonna catch on things and mess up the knitted fabric. But what I've discovered with the Brooklyn Tweed Shelter is that after I washed and blocked this, those floats actually felted down. Not completely, so it's not like 100% felted, but they stick very, very well to the sweater because this is a non-superwash um, worsted spun yarn. And so the fibers of the yarn are all going in different directions and they still have all of their natural characteristics. And generally that means that they really like to stick to each other. And so I found that in this and I love it. I haven't caught it on anything. It's really comfortable. Um, I will say, and like I said, I've literally worn this like 20 times. <laughs> like, I'm one of those people where like I cast something off and then I just wear that every single day. My poor husband, but whatever. I'm growing his child, so it's fine. Um, there is a little bit of pilling that is happening just on the underarms of this sweater, but really it's not as much as I expected with how kind of lofty and weightless this yarn is. And I imagine that um, I'll wear it for a little while. I'll use my gleaner, take off some of those pills, and I think that it will kind of like form together. Like right now, I think I'm working out some of the smaller hairs. And once those have kind of worked out, I actually imagine that this will stop pilling or pill much less. This is an incredibly warm sweater. <laughs> um, in some ways, I feel like it's too warm, but in the winter months, in the dead of winter, it's amazing. Uh, and it's so warm because it is a worsted weight sweater in, um, in woolen preparation yarn and it's all over color work so it's like a double 
It's like wearing two worsted weight sweaters together. So very warm, but very practical for the mountains of Colorado. So, which is not where I am right now, <laughs> but you know, hopefully someday we'll move back to the mountains. I love Denver, but I'm not a city person. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about is I did knit this with a new method for me, which was the ladder back jacquard method. And I have talked about this method a little bit, but essentially what it is, is a way for you to catch your color work floats that are very long while keeping the tension very even and having it be completely invisible on the front side. And if you just YouTube like ladder back jacquard, there are tons of videos that you can watch that will go over this method of knitting. And what it does is makes this knit fabric on the inside. It is kind of a double knit fabric, which again, because this is the Brooklyn Tweed, it's actually kind of hard to pull it apart now because it's kind of felted down a little bit, but it does make this fabric on the inside. And essentially each of these points you're catching the yarn. So there, there, and there. And it's amazing. Um, I love it so much. I now use it for tons and tons of other forms of knitting. And one question that I have gotten is like, how many stitches or like, where do I put in my ladder back jacquard stitches? And the thing that's so amazing about this technique is because it's completely invisible on the front side, you can put them wherever you want, which is awesome. I generally would put them in like every five fit, every, <clears throat> pardon me, like every five stitches or so. Um, but because you can't see it on the front, it like really doesn't matter. So um, I would often, as the motifs would evolve and change, I would often put one in, take one out, um, and was constantly kind of throwing them in and taking them off. So it's a really, really useful technique. And in particular, if you're knitting color work like this one that has, you know, sometimes like 30 or 40 stitches between the color work. So yeah, that was amazing. And that is my bouquet sweater. Um, I have one other finished object to talk about. And that is my socks. And I have already worn these several times. So, you know, um, that's what happens when I don't record for a whole month. <laughs> um, but these socks are amazing. They are a um, just self-drafted pattern where I did a two by two rib and then a reverse stockinette foot. And it is out of this really beautiful colorway. Um, that is just this beautiful orange and it was named after a wildflower we have here in the um, American West called the Indian paintbrush. And I really love them. They're very warm and they're very fuzzy because the base has quite a bit of mohair in it as well. Um, and yeah, I've really enjoyed these. I think something that I'm realizing is that I really love socks and wearing hand knitted socks, particularly in the winter time. And so this year I'm really trying to do my best to knit more socks because the socks that I do have, I'm going through and I'll talk about that a little bit in the mending portion. But I think that these are a very useful product that I'm not spending enough time making. So all right, with that, I think I'll move on to a little bit of mending talk. Okay, so in the last month, I have gotten into doing some visible mending. I have been 
having a couple of sad things happen to my socks. Um, one was that there was a sock that I was walking in and I accidentally caught it on a nail at my mom's house. And then the other one was I had this beautiful dog and I love him dearly, but he likes to chew things and he chewed a hole in one of my socks. So I don't remember how I heard about this, but I heard about this like speed weaver, which is just this tiny little weaving loom that is used to make woven knit patches. And it's so cool. One day I just took all of my knits and I wove little patches into them. So this is one, this is one of my Christmas socks. It's the Sprocket sock. And I made this tiny little patch. And then I was just using the same exact yarn for everything. This other one is a, another very well-loved hand knit sock of mine that's in, I think some opal yarn. And this was the one that Yampa chew a hole, chewed a hole in. And it's so fun to make these and so easy. I'm gonna turn this inside out so you can see, like these were big holes. Like this is a humongous hole that is completely encased and I can wear it again. It's so magical. So anyway, I got this little speed weaver off of Amazon for like $10. It was so cheap and I'm obsessed. I think that it is something that anyone who is making any hand knitted objects at all needs to have. And I think that you can also use it to fix um, like woven fabrics as well. I will say like the, the hole that you can fix has to be small enough to fit within this um, wooden plate, but it's still pretty big. I mean, that's probably like probably a six centimeter diameter. So I have been very pleased. All right. <sighs> I feel like every time I talk, I'm like having to remind myself to breathe because I'm so excited, but I'm also so pregnant. Um, okay. Let's move on to talking a little bit about some knitting since we've kind of been talking about knitted objects. Okay, one of my bobbins is rolling around back here. So I have been obsessed with my yellow cardigan by Marie Wallen. But y'all, some crazy shit went down where I was carrying all of my yarns for the Marie Wallen cardigan in this basket that I got from the thrift store. And then I started noticing that my yarn was like breaking a lot. And in particular, when I started knitting this top portion, and I was like, what is happening? And then it was happening more and more. And then I realized that there were some little moths in this basket and they had made like a little moth web in the back, right where this fat yarn was. I panicked y'all. I panicked. I have never had moths before. This is nothing that I have ever had to deal with. I feel like it's been kind of not even on my radar. And wow, it was stressful. I ended up taking this entire thing because the thing about moths is that they have these like tiny little eggs and tiny little larvae. And it was such a pain in the ass. There was one ball of yarn of this dark colored yarn that I literally just had to throw away. Like it was, it had been eaten by so many moths that like there was no saving the yarn. But the rest of the yarn I could save. And what I ended up doing is putting this entire sweater and all of the yarn for this sweater in the oven. And I baked it for like an hour and a half, uh, which was wild. 
Uh, I will say that the only reason I could do that is that obviously I am using um, a combination of Jameson and Smith and Jameson's of Shetland yarn. I did it that way because the top is Jameson's and Smith and the bottom is Jameson's of Shetland. Um, and that is a 100% animal fiber. So I believe if there's any like nylon or anything like that, like I think that plastic will melt. And so the only reason I could do this is because I was using entirely animal fibers. And I just put that shit in the oven and I baked it. And obviously threw away that horrible basket. So if you're getting things at the thrift store, just like check to make sure that they're all copacetic. Um, and yeah, luckily it hadn't like moved anywhere beyond the yarn that was in the basket and really just in like the back corner of the basket where there were like some of those larvae, but it was devastating and very stressful. And I have had to do a lot of spit splicing in this in order to reconnect all of those pieces of yarn that got eaten. And there were a couple that I didn't even realize where like they, I think had just eaten through one of the two plies and I didn't realize until I was knitting. And so there are a couple places where you can see like right here where I took an extra bit of yarn and like duplicate stitched over the stitch because it was just like a tiny, you know, I was like, that's gonna break eventually. So anyway, that was a horrible, horrible time, but I am finished with the entire body of this sweater, which is crazy, and I'm so excited. Um, this is something where I will go more in depth about the process of knitting this, and this will be my first ever steek, which I'm very excited about. Um, but yeah, I have knit so much on this in the last month. I think I was probably only like this far when I showed it last. So I've knit the entire rest of the top and then there are steak stitches at the side, on each side and then a steak stitch at the front, which you can see. And I love this so much. Something I will say is, man, this is like a testament to swatches don't, like swatches lie because this and the next sweater I have to talk about, swatches lied in the opposite way. But this, I did swatch for this sweater. It's hanging here on the wall because I think it's beautiful. I did swatch for this sweater, but while I was knitting it, I don't know if I like loosened up or like what happened, but my swatch was like spot on. And this is a lot bigger than <laughs> it's supposed to be. So let me just show it against my body. Like it's it's going to have probably slightly more positive ease than this, <laughs> which I was like, I'm fine. Like, whatever. It'll be what it'll be. Um, bigger for me is better because then like at least I'll definitely be able to fit into it. And this will be very cropped. So I need to block this. So I haven't blocked it at all, but I need to block it and then I'll seam the shoulders together. So it will be quite cropped. Um... And so I think it will just be a very cute cropped oversized cardigan and I am here for it. It's going to be gorgeous. I'm fine with it. Everything's fine. Um, so yeah, I am really loving this. I am excited to block it and see how the color work lays. But honestly, I think it looks really good. Let me fold it and bring it a little closer. obsessed and then there's some shoulder shaping at the top so yeah I just need to block this and then I will talk about the process of mattress stitching um, and sticking even though obviously this will just be my maker profile of this because I've never steaked before so I am not an expert but I'm really excited to try it and yeah um Wow, I've done so much knitting on it, it's crazy. 
But yeah, I'm very, very excited to stick this, do the mattress stitching, and then I think all I have to do is the arms and the button band after that. So yeah, just working away on this. I love color work. I think it's really, really enjoyable. And this is definitely going to be an heirloom sweater that I know that I will love and cherish forever. I also think, you know, with this and whatever, I'm going to be a breastfeeding mother, obviously. Um, well, not obviously. I am choosing to breastfeed. Um, and when I go back to work, I will be like pumping and stuff like that. But I do think that during the breastfeeding process, it'll be very nice to have some cardigans. So I've been trying to focus a little bit more on knitting cardigans. And I definitely want to have this finished before I push this child out of my uterus because I think this is far too complicated of a thing to be knitting on with like a newborn. So this is a high priority. And I also just think that this will be a wonderful thing to have in my wardrobe for the spring. So yeah, my Yell Cardigan by Marie Wallen. And this is part of the A Year of Marie Wallen Cal that's being hosted by a bunch of different folks here on YouTube. So there's that. And then the next knitted objects I have are in my favorite project bag. And this is a squirrel project bag that was made for me by Kat from the Heather and Hops podcast. And I bring it with me everywhere. And it's so funny because I often, this is like the thing that I bring with me to work. So I'll like have it there. And so many people are like, did you make that? And I'm like, no, my friend did. She's so talented, much more talented than me. But I love this little squirrel motif. Anyway, I have two different sock widths in here. The first one is a pair of socks for me because like I said, I'm trying to knit more socks. My goal is to knit myself a pair of socks every month, which we'll see, but that's my goal. And this is the Advent colorway from my Lambstrings yarn Advent calendar. This is the 25th day, which is this really beautiful dirty pink. And I felt like it was perfect for Valentine's Day. <laughs> so that's only in a few days. So I'm definitely not going to get this done by then. But this is just a vanilla sock. 64 stitches, heel flap and gusset. I think I just need more socks. And what I realized with this is that if I do any type of pattern, even if it's like ribbing, I do take a much longer time to knit than if I'm just knitting a vanilla sock. So that's what I'm doing. I love this colorway though. I think it's really beautiful. And then the other pair of socks I have in here is actually a DK weight pair of socks. And this is for Sean and will hopefully be a present for him for Valentine's Day. This is in the um, ooh, Fiber for the People in her, I think it's her Night Swim colorway. And I am just holding it double to make a DK weight sock. And this is really beautiful. I love it. So I finished one of the socks, which DK weight socks go so fast. And then I am frantically knitting the second sock to try to finish it by Valentine's Day. So I've already finished the heel flap and I'm working on the gusset and yeah. I really love it. I'm hoping that I will have enough leftover of this yarn to either knit the baby something, which I think like that could be really cute, or to knit myself a pair of socks, but I might be done sock knitting with this yarn, so we'll see. And the next thing I have is just my half and half triangles wrap, which I don't know if this is even worth showing because it's so boring, but I've knit from there up to there. And I just have a little bit more to go before, oh, I've dropped some stitches here. I just have a little bit more to go before I get to change to my second color. So I honestly am kind of putting this on a hold until the baby is born because I think that this will be great knitting for those early newborn time 
when I do not have the bandwidth to do anything but knit stitch. <laughs> so I honestly might, um, my goal for this would be to be finished with like adding on the new color because I think there's like some work that has to be done before adding the second color or to pick up all of the short rows and stuff. So I think I'd like to have that done before the baby arrives. Um, and then maybe once I do that, I'll just like put it in a box and finish it after the child is here. Cause I think that would be really good. And then, my last knitted object that I'm working on is the, oh, I'm forgetting the name of this sweater. It's something Creek sweater. Ah, uh, I can't remember, but I will put it here. And it is by The Native Knitter. And it is this incredible colorwork sweater that I have been wanting to knit for so long. And what happened is it was like two things that happened at once. One is that I finally found the gr grocery girls. Where have I been? I don't know. Sleeping under a rock. I love these women. They bring me so much joy. Every time I watch them, I'm just like, it is just not what I expected it to be. Like I had judgments about what I expected them to be like, and then they were very different than that and in a very refreshing and wonderful way. And I have just been binging their episodes, but right now they are doing a um, knit along where you choose patterns and or yarns that are um, designed or dyed by people in the BIPOC community. And so I really wanted to take part in that knit along and cast this on. And then the combination with that is that I also had a very good friend from residency who wanted to knit her first sweater ever and also wanted to try color work. And I was like, hey, this sweater would be perfect because the floats are relatively small and so there's only a couple of rows where you're having to catch floats and the rest of the time it's just smooth sailing and even the couple of rows where you have to catch where I caught I chose to catch floats in this um like diamond part you actually technically like could do without uh I chose to do it but like it's not 100% necessary so anyway I was like hey I've been wanting to knit this sweater for a while. The grocery girls are having this BIPOC uh, sweater knit along, or I think it's just any type of knit along. Um, it doesn't have to be a sweater, but BIPOC maker knit along. And you want to learn color work and you want to do a color work sweater. So like, let's do this. Uh, so I'm doing a like double knit along, one with the grocery girls and one with my good friend. And I went to Fancy Tiger Crafts and I got two different yarns. This one, for folks who watched my Vlogmas, you might recognize because this is the second skein of this that I bought. But this is the Farmer's Daughter Fibers in her DK weight. And this is in the fancy, like fancy farmer tiger or something like that colorway, which is specially dyed for Fancy Tiger Crafts. And it is this turquoise blue that has gold and a little bit of pink and black speckles. And to me, this looks so much like turquoise, like the stone. I love it so much. And then I initially was just going to buy this and then... I was at Fancy Tiger and this yarn was next to it. And this is also um, from Farmer's Tiger or from Farmer's Daughter's Fibers. And this is in like the Paul Newman or something like that colorway, which is just this really dark, cool brown. And I saw them together and I was like, okay, fine. Like, twist my arm, take my money. It's fine. Um, Sean always says like when I want to buy new things and I'm like, cause I really don't like spending money, but Sean's always like, you're an adult, you have a job, you're allowed. Um, which I think is adorable. He knows that it makes me stressed. And so, uh, I was there and I was like, I'm an adult, I'm allowed. 
And so I got four skeins of this and one skein of this to make this sweater. And I have finished the color work yoke and split for the sleeves. And this was another tail of my swatch line. So I did swatch for this because I was trying to be a good knitter and I wanted to show my friend how to swatch and what gauge means and all that. And I did it, but you know, it came out much smaller than I expected it to be, which is like nothing that I've ever experienced. Um, I think part of that is that normally for color work, I do go up to the next size of needles but I had actually given that size of needles to my friend to knit her sweater because my swatch was a little smaller anyway it's neither here nor there but it was smaller and so I did end up making some modifications in which I actually did more increases throughout this part of the yoke than are called for in the pattern which again I will talk about that because it was like a whole thing like the math there's like, oh wait, I can't show this because, anyway, the math was like bananas. Um, and so I've kept track of that because I, I ended up adding 50 extra stitches to it. So it wasn't like a small, small increase. It was like pretty, pretty robust. Um, but I really love this. I think to me, and it's not coming off as much, I don't think on the screen, but in person, it just looks so amazingly Western in this way that I'm just obsessed with. Um, <clears throat> because to me, this looks so much like turquoise and it just like the color story that's happening here, I'm here for it. And I just love this yarn there, like pops of orange and black. Ah, uh, I love it. I love it so much. Um, so now I'm in the kind of like boring part where it's just like stockinette and like happy knitting, but it was so, so fun and so beautiful. And um, for those of you who don't know, um, the Native Knitter, obviously, um, is native <laughs> i mean it's literally in her like title as her company name um so she is native i believe she's navajo but i'm not 100 percent sure on that um and then the dyer and owner behind farmer's daughter's fibers is also native so i believe her mother um grew up on a res um and so yeah this is like my contribution to that and it's um a design that is designed by a native american um knitwear designer who like everything that she makes i want to make um and then the yarn itself is also dyed by a native american designer or um yarn dyer so yeah i really really love this it's so beautiful and it's unlike anything that i have in my wardrobe right now so yeah, I've just been like doing all the color work. Um, and this is being housed in my uh, Fat Squirrel Fibers Cats and House Coats bag, which I love this bag. Anyway, um, that is all of the knitting I have to talk to you about. This is going to be a long one. Um, so now I'm just going to move on to a little bit of spinning chat. So, like I said, I am just going to turn on a light <laughs> in the dark. Um, I got a spinning wheel. So I have been saving up for this spinning wheel. It is um, the, I guess I can maybe try to lift it up. Um, off frame a little bit or I can just show it to you maybe. So, so pretty. I got the 
shocked or shacked um, matchless spinning wheel, which was um, really fun for me because um, for those of you who don't know, shocked is based out of Boulder, Colorado, which is just this, this beautiful spinning wheel was made by um, the hands of people who live like 30 minutes from my house, which was really, really cool for me. And um, it's such a beautiful wheel. I'm like obsessed with it, but also learning a lot because there's a lot that I don't know about it. <laughs> um, but because I'm completely new to spinning, I will say I started off with drop spindling and I have been working on that as well and have some stuff to show you. So um, this is my little swatch of some things that I had been spinning up. And the first one I feel like was too loosely spun. And then the second one was far too tightly spun. And these were both spun on my drop spindle. Here's the leftover yarns from those. And they're both like a, this one that's more loosely spun is more of a worsted weight. And this one is more of a DK weight. And then I spun two other little mini skeins, and these are from my Nest Fiber. I got her advent calendar, and so I still have um, several mini skeins from that that I can make up, and I'm just having fun kind of going through and playing with color. But this was the next one that I made, which again, this is probably like a fingering to sport weight. And it's very like springy, which I was really proud of. And then I made this one, which is also like a fingering sport weight. And this one is a little bit more tightly plied than that last one. So I think this one is a little bit over plied. Like it's not quite as springy as that last one, but still lovely. And I kind of want to make this into like the color work of a baby sweater. I think it'd be so cute. And then I am spinning this, which is some um, BFL, um, also from my fiber. And so I'm just spinning this on my drop spindle. But then I got my spinning wheel. <laughs> I like dove in head first and I took the spinning from scratch class from the School of Sweet Georgia. I signed up for the School of Sweet Georgia so that I could take um, several of their spinning classes and then who knows where I'll go from there. I think right now I'm like set, set with the spinning. Um, I guess I can look and see if they have like needle felting or something like that because there are a couple things I want to make for the baby that are needle felted. But I took the School of Sweet Georgia spinning from scratch class and spun up some Polworth into this beautiful hank of 100 grams of yarn. And this is probably like a fingering to lace weight. So I think I've discovered that I am a very fine knitter or fine spinner. And I really want to try to spin something that's not fingering weight. I want to try to spin something that's like fingering to DK or like sport weight. But this was my first ever skein of yarn spun off of my shocked matchless. And I think it's beautiful. It like hangs really well. It's so much faster than using the drop spindle. It's like crazy how fast it is. Let me get closer and see if it's a little bit thick and thin, but really it's actually like more even than I thought it was going to be. And it does have some like give. Um, and so I don't think it's like over plied, especially cause it like lays flat and I didn't like weigh this or anything. I just washed it and did the, like whacking <laughs> motion but yeah I really love it I have 423 yards of this in like 110 grams and it was Polworth 
And so I am trying to decide what to do with it. Um, part of me just wants to like look at it and be enamored by it for a little while. But part of me also thinks that it would be cool to knit it up into like a baby sweater. Um, but then it's like not super wash, which I care much less about the prickly nature of it. Like I actually don't think this is prickly at all. Um, but I just, I think I would have to dye it if I was gonna knit it into a baby sweater because like, I don't wanna keep this clean and have to hand wash it. So anyway, there are lots of different things I can do. It is just a traditional two ply. So I don't think it would be ideal for like socks, but I am knitting something or spinning up another project for socks. So I have, this BFL fiber. This is like a mixed BFL. And this is my last bit of it to spin up. And I am spinning up a traditional three ply. So I'm trying to put more spin into it to make it stronger. And then just doing it really, really thin. And so I have two different bobbins that I've finished. So this is one. I love the sheen of BFL. And this is the second one. So I just have one more bobbin to spin up and then I will spin these together into a three ply and I wanna make socks out of them. So there's no nylon in this. It's just 100% BFL, but BFL is a pretty sturdy fiber from what I understand. And I think that it will be wonderful. And I just kind of want to try some no nylon socks and see what happens. I, I'm like, obviously I'm going to spin this up and see what yarn I get. And it might be a completely different yarn that is like not suitable for socks at all. But I think like, even if it's fingering or sport weight or DK weight, then I should be able to make it into socks. And that's kind of what I want to try doing. Andrea Mowry is doing her like, um, spin it to knit it uh, sock cal right now. And part of me thinks that it would be fun to kind of join in on that, but I also don't want to buy, <laughs> it's so cheap. Like I don't want to buy her sock pattern because I already like know how to knit socks. so. Anyway, we'll see. She's like a wonderful designer, so maybe I'll do that just to support her, but I'm really excited for this. I'm just gonna try to spit up some sock yarn. Who am I? What's happening? Um, all right, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about with spinning that I think is really cool is I joined the Long Way Homestead's Breed of the Month Club. This was something that I actually heard about with the grocery girls. And I think that um, one of the grocery girls gets the yarn, but I decided to get the fiber. And so I got this four ounces. <laughs> the mailman has arrived. Um, so I got four ounces and this is Coradale and it's really beautiful. The thing that was so cool about this, you guys, is it came in just like a letter package. Like it was just like a letter and this was vacuumed sealed. So it was really small and then it just poofed right up. And I thought that was so cool because the packaging was like incredibly minimal. Um, I'm terrified of mom, so I moved it to this other bag. But the cool thing about this is that it's a breed of the month club. So it will allow me to try a bunch, try spinning a bunch of different breeds. And I'm hoping to kind of keep notes on like my favorite breeds. But the front kind of talks about the Coradale sheep. And then, um, it says, um, the cordial wool we source comes from various farms in Saskatchewan, Canada. So it's from like small producers in Canada. And then the back kind of talks about the nature of the wool and like what it's good for. Um, 
and kind of some history about the wool itself. So I'm really excited for this and each one is undyed. So it's just like the color of the wool from the sheep and I'm really excited. I so far have this one and I'm gonna try to knit it up or spin it up, you know, one a month and kind of learn throughout the year. And it was pretty inexpensive. Like I think the fiber itself, like it's all supporting small shepherds and small businesses in Canada, which is not too far from where I live. And it was only like 24 Canadian dollars a month. So it was very inexpensive. And it's just fun to get this little package in the mail, but I was very excited when I came and it was just like a tiny little package. So that is all of the crafting talk I have today. So I am just going to move on and talk about what I have been reading. All right, I have a few different books to talk about. Um, so I'll start off by talking about the books that I finished reading in January. So it's slightly less than normal, but you know, I'm just embracing whatever happens. <laughs> Uh, my goal for this year is to read about 50 books, um, which I read about 80 books last year, so it's a little bit less, but I think just with having a kid and all of the things that that entails, I'm wanting to be gentle with myself, and so I'm okay with reading slightly less. But the first book I read was um, Sally Rooney's Beautiful World, Where Are You?, and this was great. I loved Normal People, written by Sally Rooney. And so I already went into this with like high expectations and thinking that I was going to love it. And to be honest, I was not disappointed. I also thought this was great. And I thought this was like slightly more happy and uplifting than Normal People. So if you're like very turned off by Normal People because of the fact that it's uh, I don't want to like spoil normal people for you, but normal people is very messy and everybody involved is very messy and the relationship itself is very messy and that's kind of the whole point of that novel. And the ending is also very messy. Um, I feel like I can say that much without giving too much away, um, but the ending is also very messy. And so um, this one follows two best friends who are living apart, um, but somewhat close together in the sort of like Dublin, Ireland area. So one of them lives in Dublin and one of them lives um, in like a smaller village a few hours from the city. And it's about their friendship from when they were roommates together in college, kind of through their early adult life. And it's about the people who they meet and it's about love and it's about finding connection and um, it's beautiful. I loved it. I mean, like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. I feel like as a millennial, this just like pulls on all my millennial heartstrings. Like it's a, it's like, a book written by a millennial for millennials, I feel like. Um, it's just kind of like brooding and sarcastic and they're people who've lived through some shit but like are kind of just bizarre. I don't know. <laughs> Everything about it is just kind of bizarre. Um, but I really loved it. There's one relationship that I really enjoyed that is a friends to lovers romance. And I think I've talked about this in the past when I was talking about like people we meet on vacation and um, like in a holidays. The friends to lovers romance is one of my favorite romance tropes of all time. And that is because that's like my love experience like my falling in love experience was definitely a friends to lovers romance and I just thought that this was it was depicted very well in this and particularly what I loved about this was that murky in between time where you're kind of transitioning from being friends to lovers and how awkward that is and how much like 
The communication style of people in a relationship is just completely different from the communication style of people who are just like <laughs> start off in a relationship. So like friendship and relationship communication is different. And I think that early on in a friends to lovers romance in a real, at least this is my experience, things are very murky at the beginning and there's a lot of insecurity and there's also the added weight of the fact that like you fall for the people very fast because you've known them for so long that like you know all their icky bits already and at the same time I think that it can be a very stressful experience because there's more weighing on it because if it doesn't work out and if things go catastrophically badly then you're not just losing a partner you're also losing like your best friend and so there's an added layer of like insecurity and worry and doubt and I just thought that this was portrayed beautifully um so yeah I really enjoyed it I would highly recommend it. I think I gave it like four stars. I loved it. The next book I have to talk about, I also really enjoyed. I actually loved all three of these books. I feel like I'm starting off the year with a real like, oh, on a real high. And right now I'm listening to the seventh book of Harry Potter. So things are happening that are bringing me a lot of joy. But this was um, Under the Whispering Door by TJ Klune. I think I also gave this four out of five stars. It was so good. Um, I, for those of you who've been around for a little while, um, I also read TJ Klune's, he's got several novels, but his last novel was The House in the Cerulean Sea. And I also read that one and I gave that five out of five stars. Like, that book made me cry tears of joy, which I don't know if I've ever had that experience before while reading. Like, it was so good. Ah, it's one of my favorite books of all time. Like, it is on my shelf of, like, favorite books of all time. I have, like, a bookshelf that's just, like, all of the books that I feel like are absolute perfection, and it's on there. So when I saw that Under the Whispering Door was coming out, I knew that I needed to pick it up immediately. And this follows a man named, <laughs> it's like kind of hard to describe. So it follows a man who is kind of a quirky, hardworking lawyer. And he takes his job very seriously and he takes his life very ser seriously and he really only cares about work and then he dies of a heart attack and it is about him being in the in-between time from when he's died to crossing over and the people that he meets along the way to try to help him come to terms with his death and his life and where to go from here and it is so heartwarming and so beautiful and oh, I really loved it. I thought it was so quirky and so interesting. There are obviously, um, so he meets many ghosts um, and you know, it talks about death and grieving and loss. And so I think, you know, go into this book with definitely more um, trigger warnings than the house in the Cerulean Sea. There is talk of suicide and death by murder. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot in this because it's, you know, people kind of coming to terms with their own death and like moving on. Um, but I found it to be really beautiful. And for me, um, having lost one of my best friends, Eddie, um, this year, it was a really beautiful read for me because I think it helped me come to terms with his loss um, and recognizing, you know, that he wouldn't be this this person who even would be in this in-between time, you know? Like he lived his life with no regrets and with such, like he lived so many lives in comparison to even me, you know? Like he 
just really, really lived life to the fullest and loved so hard and like wore his heart on his sleeve and his life was an adventure that for him moving on to whatever's next, I think would be very easy because he has no regrets. I'm like <laughs> gonna tear up, but it was really meaningful and really beautiful. Um, for me to experience and I think all of us unfortunately um, have experienced loss and yeah I found this to be really beautiful and also like very uplifting and very quirky and if you haven't read anything by TJ Klune before <laughs> his writing style is like super quirky and super silly but like really deep and beautiful as well um and yeah there were things about this that like made me connect with like my partner and yeah so i really love this i highly recommend it um i also highly recommend the house in the cerulean sea who i've also read by this but um know that there are some trigger warnings going into this so be gentle with yourselves and um maybe read about the trigger warnings before you go in. I will say, um, <laughs> um, there is an author's note at the very beginning that kind of goes through it. And um, it says, this story explores life and love as well as loss and grief. The, there are discussions of death in different forms, quiet, unexpected, and death by suicide. Please read with care. Um, so, I really liked that because I feel like TJ Klune is very understanding that um, the subject matter might be difficult for some people, but I will say that um, it made me laugh. Like it's silly and funny and interesting, but there's like the other um, big trigger for this that I feel like isn't really brought up in that um, is that there's also a character that um, lost a child and um discussion about death of a child and so that is also very near and dear to my heart and um so yeah go into this with knowing that in mind but highly recommend this it was so good and if you haven't read the house in the cerulean sea like what are you doing it literally feels like a hug it's so good and then the last book i read <laughs> is very triggering too, um, but for many different reasons. And that is Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. This was so fucking good. I literally couldn't put it down. I read it in like two days. It was so good. So this follows um, two men as they avenge the deaths of their sons. So um, I just kind of want to read this because uh, it's... Uh, it's so good. So essentially there are two men who are brutally murdered and they are married to one another and both of their fathers are ex-cons. So um, one of them is Ike and one of them is Buddy Lee. Those are the fathers um, and they are both um, ex-cons who have spent a considerable amount of time in prison um, and one of which or both um, for violent offenses, for like murder. Um, and their sons are brutally murdered and they are the type of people who um, didn't really accept their sons for being gay when they were alive and had a lot of issues with dealing with that and in their deaths come to realize that all of those issues and all of those um, feelings that they had that their sons weren't enough or that there was something wrong with them like completely dissipate once they realize that like all that really matters is that they're alive and well and now that they're gone they kind of come to terms with how they wish they would have done things differently in life and oh my god it's so good but it's also like one of the most violent books I've ever read. Like it literally, I don't know if you've seen that movie um, with Denzel Washington called Man on Fire, where he's like avenging the kidnapping of like Dakota Fanning when she's a little kid. It's very similar to that. Like it is 
these two men who are killing and torturing a lot of people to try to get to the bottom of who murdered their sons and to avenge their deaths. And in doing so, also to, in their own way, connect with their sons, which is so bizarre. Like, it's, it's kind of interesting because like, if I were to have been brutally murdered, I would not want my loved ones to go on a killing rampage and like murder all of the people who were part of my death. But I don't know, there was something like really beautiful about this in a very like unexpected way. Like it is so fucked up and so violent. Like. There's so much death, there's so much destruction, there's so much torture, but there's also so many beautiful conversations between these two men who are trying to come to terms with the wrong ways in which they were thinking about their sons and like embracing that the the fact that like it didn't matter that their sons were gay like that's the least important thing to them like the only thing that matters is that they were alive and so yeah it's so beautiful and so interesting and if you again like think that you can handle this insane subject matter and like very violent book i highly recommend it because i thought it was fantastic it's also just written in such like a quick but not too quick like it's just perfect i loved it i definitely want to read more by sa cosby because like this was so 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 good um so yeah that was razor blade tears by sa cosby um the only other thing that i am currently reading besides uh harry potter is ina may's guide to childbirth <laughs> and um also, for those of you who have been new to um, the Sonder Knitting and Reading podcast, you will know that um, nonfiction is not my favorite thing to read. And it's really hard for me. Like, I've been reading this book for like two months, and it's not that long. It's like, you know, 300 pages, more or less, and I've read several other 300 page books just in one month. So yeah, it's not really my jam nonfiction. Um, I think it's great and I'm kind of embarrassed to like say that I don't read a lot of nonfiction, but the reason I don't is because with my work, I'm like constantly reading and constantly learning and constantly reading like scientific text. And so it's just like not what I want to do in my free time. <laughs> um, but I am reading this uh, because I'm in my third trimester and giving birth soon. And I will say that there are a lot of things about this book that I really love, but I just read part of it that kind of annoyed me as a physician. Because I will say, I feel like this book was written before things have really changed in medicine. Um, so maybe it is kind of, in response to the way things used to be. Um, but I'm just in this part that's like the different screening options and like different things that we do to kiddos right after they're born. And the fact that you should like not do these things kind of irks me a little bit because I think it's gotten, at least this specific part got very preachy and very like anti-Western medicine which for me as a doctor is kind of hard to read. Um, but yeah, I just think that there's some misguided anger towards like the medical system that I think also perpetuates some bad juju between birthing mothers and doctors. But maybe that's, I'm like that I'm sure is just me. And, you know, it is interesting. Like, I think Colorado is a very different place. Like, I was at my midwife um, appointment just a couple of days ago. And it was so interesting because my midwife was like, um, I was just 
be, it was a new midwife because essentially how it works here is like we have multiple different midwives um, in the same practice and you meet all of them and you kind of go through all of them and then like one of them will be there for your delivery but it's not like your specific midwife will 100% be there for your delivery and it was interesting because this was a new midwife and she just moved to Colorado from Michigan and she was like, oh, you're a doctor? Like in Michigan, the doctors never go to the midwives, which I just think is so backwards and so crazy. But um, so it may also just be that like, I am from Colorado and like grew up in the mountains of Colorado where it's very like hippy dippy granola. And I probably have parts of that like hippy dippy granola bits to myself, which I 100% do. Um, but there are things in here that are like very misguided, like um, talking about not getting swabbed for like group B strep because you don't want to get antibiotics. And like, I understand that it's like annoying to have to get antibiotics, but like group B strep is this type of strep that gives newborn babies meningitis that then kills them or like blinds them. like. There are a lot of horrible, horrible things that happen if kids get group B strep and like I've seen that and so for me I'm like, okay, like the risk of like taking some antibiotics while you're laboring and before you give birth as compared to like the risk of like what group B strep will do to your child if they get it is crazy. And so for me to like read that I was kind of like, okay, come on. Um, and then there's other things like that we do where we give like a vitamin K shot and we give, um, ointments, um, to like the eyes and things like that. And it's like very low risk to the baby, but like huge re reward. Like the mothers who like refuse the vitamin K shot and like, to me, I'm just like one little shot in their thigh and like you essentially completely eliminate the risk of them having like horrible bleeding in their brain. But I don't know. It's just a little bit like hard for me as a pediatrician to read the this specific chapter. Um, and this is the like what you need to know about pregnancy or like prepartum. Um, it was, it's been a little bit, like, I've been a little bit turned off by this book. I still want to finish it because I do find, like, the relaxation techniques and the breathing techniques and, like, the actual birthing techniques to be really helpful. But, like, there are some times where I just want to be, like, stop. Like, this is why these treatments don't happen. And then, like... I, as a pediatrician, see like the downstream effects of that. And I just think that it's like, there are some things where I'm like, you just don't know what you're talking about, but that's okay. Cause there are other things where you really know what you're talking about. And so maybe I should just stop reading this chapter and I should move on. But anyway, <laughs> I'm like, can you tell that I just read that chapter? And I was like, everything you're saying is wrong, but that's fine. Um, yeah, like there was also one where it was like, you shouldn't do the gestational diabetes um, test because there's no treatment for gestational diabetes, which like is wrong. Like there is treatment for gestational diabetes. Um, and knowing that mothers have gestational diabetes is really important for the like health, well-being and development of the fetus. So I don't know. There are some things where I'm like, all right, like, you just don't know what you're talking about with this specific thing and I am very well educated on this and that part was very frustrating but other than that I'm really loving this book so um yeah with that I need to get some sleep because I need to go to my night shift at the emergency department but it was so fun to come back on here and connect with you all and I hope that you are enjoying these last few um, weeks of winter as we head into the spring equinox and I hope you're enjoying the sun coming up earlier and earlier every day and the nights getting longer or the nights getting shorter and shorter, the days getting longer and longer 
and I'm hoping you're taking some time to make something beautiful, mend something, um, and tell people that you love them that you love them, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye.